morning. I'm so glad that you are joining us today on Facebook and YouTube. Uh, we are in a place that we did not expect to be this week. Um, as Dolly Parton says, Here we go again? Uh, yeah, anybody want to sing Here We Go Again? Yes, yeah. yes. well, here we are. And it feels a little bit, thank you. She knows, he knows that song. We are uh, not expecting to be in a situation where we have no one or only a few of us in the room, and yet here we are, and we are glad you are with us. Um, as you are joining in, we hope that you will be inspired by the words today and enjoy and be inspired by the music as well. Um, we uh, look forward to an opportunity to, to worship with you today. I do have a few things to tell you about, just a few quick words going on. You know, we're not going to be able to do uh, the in the building type things this coming week, so we do have a few opportunities for you, uh, even so. Um, on Wednesday, we have prayer time. And, you know, there's no better thing for us all to be doing right now than praying. So I hope you'll uh, call in on Wednesday morning at 9 o'clock. If you need that information, you can do that. Let the church office know, and we will uh, set you up. And also, Wednesday night, we have an Advent study that is by Zoom. And we are um, looking forward to uh, learning together and, and being equipped as the disciples that we need to be, even in this time. Now, next Sunday, the 13th, we are going to do something a little bit different. We are going to have a Christmas caravan, and we hope to uh, take uh, a little bit of Christmas joy around to some of the neighborhoods close by, and if you are interested in decorating your vehicle and being in the Christmas caravan where we will drive past homes and just give a little cheer, um, nobody's going to get out of their cars or anything like that, um, we're just trying to uh, let people know that we love them. And this is one way that we can do it. If you would like to be part of that, please let us know with the church office so that we can uh, plan accordingly. We need to know how many folks we're going to have. That's going to be 3 o'clock next Sunday, but I need you to let us know this week, okay? And um, Dolly, pardon me? Uh, I think we are ready to worship. Let's worship. I'm ordered myself. That's all right. Okay. We do thank you all for tuning in this morning. And yeah, this thinks that we can't all be together, but. Uh, uh, if you're watching this live, which uh, obviously you are, that phone is, is going to want to scroll at some point. You fight it, and let's stay here and let's worship together this morning.
time for prayer? Yes, it is. Let's pray. What can we possibly have to pray about this morning? <laughs> I can't imagine. I can't imagine. On any Sunday, let alone this Sunday, uh, we do want to uh, ask you to gather around and, and let us pray today, the second Sunday of Advent. Uh, one name that I'll lift up for you today is Lonnie Ray. Uh, and like Beverly, let's, let's be in prayer for Lonnie, uh, especially today and in, in these days to come. I know there are folks that are on your hearts, your minds, um, right where you are. You can name them out loud. You can name them in your hearts. But this is our time together to pray. And so I invite us to do just that. Let us pray. O come, O come, Emmanuel, be born in us. Be born around us and into this year that continues to throw challenge after challenge after challenge at us. God, when you came to us in the person of Jesus Christ, you didn't come into a world that was um, already at peace. You came into a world that was already struggling and struggling with us. Uh, the forces of darkness that would come at us. We still fight the enemy of death, sickness. There are all of these things that try to come before us. But Emmanuel, when you are born in us, then you dispel the darkness. You make things light. You give us hope and you give us peace like nothing in this world can. And so as we are in this Advent season, help us to remember that you came to us as a baby. You will come again in glory. And in the meantime, you are with us to hold us and gather us close to yourself. Lord, we pray for Lonnie. Lonnie and Beverly, and like them and so many others who are suffering right now. And God, we pray that you will draw close to their side. May those who are in special need of, of your presence to just be keenly aware that you are holding them. Hear us at, at home or wherever we gather as we either speak aloud a, a name, as we speak in our hearts to you, where we know that you are already ready to hear us, even when we are not ready to pray, even when we don't know how. God, hear us this morning, and because we're your children, always, always, you give us words that we can say, and so hear us say together the words of our Lord's Prayer, when we say, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven, give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Our saints of the king.
praise. I believe that. Thank you, Jason. Thank you, Montana. Thank you, Carly. Uh, thank you, Ron. Back there. Don't you, Ron? <laughs> Today we'll be in the book of Mark. Uh, just pulling up Mark chapter 1 in verse 1. And it says, The beginning of the good news of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. As it is written in the prophet Isaiah, See, I am sending my messenger ahead of you, who will prepare your way. The voice of one crying out in the wilderness, Prepare the way of the Lord, make his paths straight. John the baptizer appeared in the wilderness, proclaiming a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. And people from the whole Judean countryside and all the people of Jerusalem were going to him and were baptized by him in the river Jordan, confessing their sins. Now John was clothed with camel's hair, with a leather belt around his waist, and he ate locusts and wild honey. He proclaimed, The one who is more powerful than I is coming after me. I am not worthy to stoop down and untie the thong of his sandals. I have baptized you with water, but he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. This is where it starts. This is where the gospel, the good news starts. That's what the word gospel means, is good news. And I get fascinated sometimes when I, sometimes, every time, when I get in there and I read uh, about all the prophecies that were fulfilled by Jesus. Even just in his birth alone, how many uh, dozens, maybe hundreds of prophecies were fulfilled by Jesus' birth alone. Already all signs are pointing that this is the Messiah. This is the Son of God. It was written in Isaiah, and Mark quotes Isaiah, I'm sending my messenger ahead of you who will prepare the way. So John the Baptist was that messenger to tell people to get ready. People get ready. The thing of it is now, though, is we are the messengers. We are the messengers who it is our duty to tell people to prepare the way because Jesus is coming again. He is coming again. It will happen. Now, we have, to, we have to think about that sometimes. And I hope that you think sometimes that you would put yourself in a situation if you ever were to come into contact with somebody who says, I don't know who Jesus is. I don't know. Uh, and, and you go, gosh, where do you start? When that opportunity comes and you go, man, I don't know, where, where do you start? And usually, I will start to say, well, what do you know about Jesus? What do you think you know? What have you heard about Jesus? Some people don't accept that the message of Jesus and the salvation of Jesus is a simple message. Salvation as a principle is very simple. You know, Jesus did all the hard work. Now, yes, we have our difficulties here living in this world to, to continue to be saved and live like we are saved. But John the Baptist came ahead. It says in verse 3, he says, the voice of one crying out in the wilderness. Now, sometimes I think of, uh, uh, what's that guy's name, Ben Stein, right? Bueller. Bueller, he's giving this very monotone lecture on uh, economics and all this kind of stuff. And this is the direct opposite from John the Baptist. John the Baptist was not down there in the river going, uh, now y'all, this, this is my cousin's coming. And he's going to save y'all. And, and, and y'all need to get right. She's going, he is one crying in the wilderness, shouting, repent! Shouting out to the top of his lungs. One who is coming is greater than I, who I am not worthy to reach down and tie the all of his sandals. There was pure passion here. Let me tell you, people weren't going out there to see John the Baptist to be saved. They were going to see John the Baptist to witness the spectacle that was going on out there. Y'all, there 
there is this crazy man who is out there at the Jordan River in the middle of nowhere wearing camel skin. He smells really, really, really bad more than likely. And he is calling out people, y'all got to come see this. So I said before, we are messengers. Especially sometime in this day and age, it feels like we are in the wilderness. We are in the wilderness. And it's, it's very easy when you're around the church bubble. And we can come in here and we can say, oh yeah, Jesus is good. Everything is wonderful. It's all fine. And then something happens. And you get out there in the world. And there's dangerous things out there in the wilderness. So you think about what's in the wilderness. So let's think about when you think wilderness, just period. What do you think about? Well, I think about things that can kill me. I think about lions. And I think about tigers. And if I'm in this wilderness out here, if I was to go out in the backwoods of my house out there, uh, hey, they, you know, they got the Mississippi Panther that, uh, that goes out there. Now, there's no biological evidence that any panthers exist, but I've heard Oh, yes, I have heard of, and I know that they've got great big claws and great big fishies coming out of their mouth, and they can kill me. There are things out there in the spiritual wilderness in which we dwell. Also, <clears throat> things that can kill us, things that can hurt us. But there are also things that are life-giving. Problem is, we have to search a little more for those things. You have to have a little bit of knowledge in order to survive out there. And so, as we think about our our our, our spiritual wilderness in which we dwell, because everything that we are to do as Christians, everything should, and we use that word a whole lot in sermons and teaching, what we should do, all our Christian life should be preparing for Jesus and helping to prepare other people for the second coming of Jesus. We are to continue the job that John the Baptist started. Absolutely. You always have advanced men for important people. To me, it's one of the coolest things, no matter who's in the White House, to see a presidential motorcade, to see all those cars coming in, letting you know somebody important is coming for security, for just, just to make a statement, it's a wonderful thing. You know, and you hear people who travel, big time people and speakers and musicians and all that, there's always an advanced person from their camp that goes ahead to make sure everything is okay for their arrival. Well, that's kind of what we want to do for Jesus and people who are in the wilderness, who are unbelievers, or who are ignorant, who never heard. We are to make the way good so when Jesus comes back, you can go, all right, yeah, the guy's got it going on. There's not a whole lot of work to do. Wouldn't that be wonderful? Wouldn't it be wonderful? John the Baptizer appeared in the wilderness proclaiming a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. Why in the wilderness? Why? Because that's where the lost people were, maybe. Maybe he would, because he knew he wouldn't have been allowed. Now, it would have been very easy for John the Baptist to say, no, 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 I'm, I'm the Savior's cousin, and I've got a good message. If I can't preach in the temple, well, then I just ain't going to preach. He absolutely could have said that. But no. Even in this day of age, I think I talked last week about when we sometimes dwell on what we don't have, what we can't do, as opposed to dwelling on what we do have and what we can do. So what did John have? John had nothing. He had nothing material-wise. He didn't have a, a nice setup. He didn't have a built-in audience. He didn't have a, a nice PA system. He didn't have high catering to, uh, to feed him, obviously. No, what did he have? He had the good news of Jesus. That is all he had. And he had a voice. That's all he had. That is all he needed. So, as I said before, people were coming to be saved. They were coming to see a spectacle and wound up getting saved and hearing the gospel. 
See, even, even churches, we have to find a reason to get people in the door. We have to find a reason to get people to hear the gospel. Now, I'll tell you something sad, and then now even, even something there that's going away. Sometimes, the only time people are exposed to the gospel is a funeral. Think about that for a minute. That's the only time when people who are unchurched or who are unbelieving, they will come to a uh, funeral of someone that they love. And more often than not, the gospel will be, and I feel, for uh, believers, should be preached. Now, what's bad is, is that many preachers have botched this opportunity to reach out. I have sat at so many funerals and cringed at what the preacher was saying. And I'm like, you know what? If I wasn't already a believer, I'd walk out of this place and I'd never step foot in church again. Because we get too caught up. We try to overcomplicate the message. We try to make things about ourselves as opposed to about Jesus. We are nothing without Jesus. Let me tell you. John must have been very, very convincing. Why? Because people show up out there and they start confessing their sins. Now, what in this world would make you sit down and start confessing your sins? And I wonder, I wasn't there. And so I have to wonder, was it a blanket sin, kind of like we do in the Methodist Church? We have, we again, we are sinners. Or did they go through and go, no, 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 no. We we're going to do an itemized return on these sins here. Each individual thing. Have you thought about that later? What if you did have to do that? If you had to list your sins one by one. If it was me, we'd be here a while, friends. We'd be here a while. Because our sin is great. In this day and age, our sin is great. Great. And why is our sin great? Because we've gotten away from the message of John, who said to repent. And he was out there crying, he was shouting, he was wanting so bad for the people who were lost to turn around in their sinful life. And that's what repent means. It means to turn away. See, this day and age, we don't talk about that much. We don't preach that much. We don't preach that people need to repent and run away from sin. We got to learn and teach and show how to kind of get around sin or how to work with sin. How we take our sin to Jesus and then we grab it and we bring it back with us when we need, right? Sometimes when we are supposed to pray, we are supposed to, you talk about people leaving their sins at the foot of the cross. And we do leave our sins at the foot of the cross. But when we leave, we just have to pick up our sins and we thank them. Which totally defeats the whole purpose. This says that John was clothed with camel's hair and a leather belt around his waist, and he ate locusts and wild honey. So, you know, it's kind of funny. You, you got folks who, who try to. Uh, <laughs> try to mimic people who they um, they try to uh, mimic people who they look up to. You know, you have impersonators and you have uh, people who dress up. You know, you see somebody on TV and you admire them and, or you want to go, oh yeah, well, I'll wear that suit. You know, it's a big thing. You know, I can't remember who the first contemporary worship leader was that had the long soul patch. Uh, but you know, and then now all of a sudden, now every worship leader has everything shaped like they got their little soul patch on there, you know, because obviously it'll make you a better worship leader if you do that, right? Well, I don't see too many people uh, going out. You see people who dress up like Jesus, right? Put on the robe, they'll put on the sandals, they'll carry their cross. I don't see too many people down in Lake Lincoln dressed in camel's hair and leather and eating uh, wild locusts and honey. <laughs> I don't see too many people doing that. You know, that new breakfast cereal. Honey nut grasshoppers. The breakfast of prophets. <laughs> yes. But John proclaimed, he said, The one who is more powerful than I am is coming after me, and I am not worthy to stoop down and untie the bone with sandals. You see, John was preaching a truth that he understood 
very well. John understood that when he started going and people started confessing their sins and people started being baptized with water, John had his own disciples. A lot of disciples that were Jesus' disciples were originally John's disciples. He had his own disciples. And he could have built this. He could have made this work and say, you know what? Yeah, it is me. A lot of people thought he was the Messiah. And John absolutely could have played into that and said, oh, it's me, brother. Yeah, let's get this party started. So why didn't he do that? Because John knew the truth. He knew the truth. He knew that somebody was coming who was greater than he was. See, John knew that he was created, but that Jesus was the creator. Jesus was the creator. And one of the things that Jesus taught that John showed very well is that to be a Christian is to be a servant, right? It's to be, and, and, and instead of John saying, you know, yeah, here's Jesus, he is the Messiah, he is the Savior of the Lord, and, and, and I'm his cousin, and, and I'm kind of the announcer in the MC, so I should be right there with him, right? You know, wherever Jesus is getting his picture made, old John might be in there, would be in there too, right? But no, John is saying, y'all don't understand. I am not even worthy to tie this man's sandals on his feet. I am not worthy to be a Christian. To be a saved Christian is to be a humble servant. A humble servant with a message that is so wonderful, a message that is so enduring, a message that is eternal saving. And you know that message. You know the message. Jesus died for your sins. We are called to be messengers in the wilderness. We are called to prepare people, wherever they are, for the second coming of Jesus. By talking about his first coming, that's something that we can do. As you go on this week, as we go through mandates, as we go through all the, the junk and gunk that is on the news today, I would encourage you to turn off the news, to turn off the phones, to spend a little more time with Scripture and prayer, and the world will seem like a better place. Amen and amen. Let me pray. Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for John the Baptist. Father, we thank you for passion. We thank you for the spectacle that caused people to be tuned in to you. Father, help us to learn from that. Father, as we go through our own wilderness, Lord, that we can keep you as the center and that we always have you to turn to and run to. God, we thank you for this time to be together. Father, we pray for a time soon we can be together physically again. Lord, as we go through this Christmas season, 